Hi, I'm Peter Cowan, the Bee Whisperer. I am at my Monroe yard, um, where I, I've had bees here for a few years, and I've been working here with Mark Fulford, who is the farmer and owns owns this farm. Uh, but Mark's also an expert and international consultant for organic farming, and so we we're talking about the cover crop right next to my bees here, the buckwheat. And uh, I was telling about my previous experience with buckwheat and Mark started to explain why the buckwheat produces nectar at some times and sometimes doesn't. And uh, I persuaded Mark to try to uh, put a, uh, to tell me again, and this is actually the third time he's telling me, uh, so we could record it. So, Mark, thank you very much. Okay. Well, Peter, one of my experience with growing crops uh, with bee yards around is the bees are a really great indicator whether the crop has enough mineral uh, strength and fortitude to produce surplus sugars, which equates for uh, a crop farmer into flavor, shelf life, and higher nutrient density in the plant. And uh, with bees, you probably, you can't fool them. They know when the flower's got nectar and they know when it doesn't. And I've noticed here with uh, Peter's bees that they they're after the buckwheat before the sun is even up, which is a surprise for some folks. And uh, usually the bees take their good old time getting out to breakfast. Yeah, the only time I've seen bees doing that is when they're rubbing out honey from my empty honey soup. Oh. You'll see them up before dawn, but yeah, uh, yeah. I've not heard of it happening it's on low, on low hanging as fruit. Well. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But it seems the buckwheat is the same thing worth getting up early for. Yeah, the, the richer the soil in minerals, the more interested all wildlife is in it. And um, we notice that with the uh, the pattern of what the, D's are, the, the deer come and do their damage too, of course. But uh, we use um, a very potent mix of minerals, an organic mix that the Amish make for us actually, uh -huh. uh, down all the way down Pennsylvania. But um, we rely on that to produce much higher nutrient density in our crops. And if it's a seed crop or a grain crop, like buckwheat's a seed crop too, uh, we want to have a really high embryo weight and a very high germination count. So if we're selling a, a small portion of our crop as seed, say to a seed company or saving it ourselves, we want very, very high germ rates. And that requires nutritional density in the soil. And uh, this is a, a classic example of the bees know it and the quality of our plants, even though this is a very droughty year right now, uh, the buckwheat's strong good colored even though it's not wilting and it wasn't fed nitrogen right yeah so i'd, I'd had bees in uh, buckwheat before um maybe 50 acres of buckwheat and i had 40 hives in there and i had always assumed that they for some reason they produced no honey and i'd assumed it was because of the heat but you're telling me that in particular the uh, phosphorus and the calcium probably oh, paid apart a big part um, if a farmer relies on um, nitrogen and potassium or uses a type of phosphorus that locks up in the soil, which it tends to do anyway, mm -hmm. um, the plant has very poor uptake. And phosphorus and calcium in particular are uh, sugar makers in all crops. And motivating them in the plant requires a little bit more thinking through. And you can apply it in the soil as a dry form or you can also foliar uh, spray a crop with those elements if, uh, if you have a good formula that can be taken up by the leaf. But we notice if we leave the minerals out, particularly um, uh, plant available or organic sources of phosphorus, and it's not a lot, it's just the right kind, uh, then we have, we have successes that we can't attribute to anything else. And uh, you know, woe on us if we forget to amend with our broad spectrum minerals, because then we do a lot of work for nothing right so we're we're always learning uh, we notice our grain growers even people who probably produce uh, legumes or clovers or whatever they if they skip uh, nutrition in the soil they pay the price the plant can only do so much and if the lowest denominator is uh, one or two elements or minerals that affects the entire crop for the mm -hmm. season now, can you tell me what we're doing in this this field here in particular, and why why you're doing this? Uh, see, you've got um, rows of pumpkins down here. 
Yeah, there's pumpkins and, well, pretty much buried in the buckwheat right now as yeah. you know, some of the smaller plants. But as the buckwheat passes, which will be fairly quickly, the squashes and pumpkins will reach out over top of the buckwheat crop and vine sort of conquer the fields, so to speak. But we won't just stop with the buckwheat. When it goes past, we'll allow it to uh, go to seed. Most people would say, oh, you have to plow it down because you want, don't want it to become a weed next year. And we want the buckwheat to regenerate every year if possible. It's a very easy plant for us to mow or move or weed whack out of the way. But while it's giving us something, we'll always let it have its way. Uh, so we might follow the buckwheat with another oil seed crop that tends to produce a very high nectar value way into November, and that would be Brassica juncea, which is an oil seed mustard from India. And it's a soil builder like buckwheat. Neither one of them fixes nitrogen, but they're a good companion plant to uh, open the way for clovers. In this case, it might be uh, oil seed mustard, Dutch white clover, bell beans, and winter wheat. So that sounds complicated, but uh, we're interested in having our, um, uh, all aspects of the farm do double duty, serve more than one purpose at a time. Mm -hmm. So if it's uh, helping the bees, which helps our orchard and our, a lot of our crops dramatically, then it's gonna, it's gonna help everything all the way around. Absolutely. And uh, crops like this, at this time, are closing up the gap when we would normally have a dearth uh, the goldenrod, although some's in flower, is not producing much nectar yet, mm -hmm. and a lot of the a lot of the normal clover, white clover, has pretty much stopped producing nectar. Yeah. So this sort of fills the gap very nicely. We're also undertaking a planting this year of sainfoin, which people in the northeast are not used to thinking about. The sainfoin is one of the highest nectar-producing crops in the Upper West states mm -hmm. and it happens to do very very well in Maine and it doesn't take a lot of fertility doesn't want any nitrogen because it's a legume and it's a perennial may reach three four feet on a good year has a pink flower uh, everything loves it all livestock and all bees love it and that would be uh, probably the top of the icing on the cake to have a same for foin crop planted now with a little water, like some calcium, and then have it in bloom at the time when we most need uh, an extra midsummer push of nectar. Mm -hmm. It can take a lot of drought. Right. So and we're uh, getting more and more of that these yeah, days. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. I like working multiple uh, nectar-producing crops into our farm system because they're always doing something for our soil while they're doing something for the bees. Right. And and you say you you are planting same point this year. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you doing that? That'll be down below in the lower field. There's another acre and a half down there. Very nice. Can't quite see it from here. No. A good place uh, for me to to grow sane foin would be down where the uh, goldenrod is. Yeah. I could mow a strip and I could no-till seed it. Right. It doesn't compete well because it's a delicate plant when it's young. But there are ways to get a piece of ground ready and then get it into the soil in time for it to um, get established. It does, mm -hmm. it does fix a lot of nitrogen. And uh, I mean, that would be a fairly dramatic plant to have in patches in with the goldenrod. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly grateful for the uh, extra plants that you put in with the thought of the bees in mind and uh, certainly helpful. Hopefully we can get uh, more people thinking that way and if they have more questions, I'll uh, probably pass on your contact details if they Sounds want to get great. more yeah. information. I know a lot of uh, uh, folks that watch the channel are farmers as well. Well, this, that's the tip of the iceberg. We could we could go on for hours because there's so many things. That, oh, well, that's right. We, yeah. are, we often have a lot of conversations yeah. about this, isn't it? That's, that's great. It's always, uh, for me, time well spent yeah. having, a having a chat with you. Same here. Uh, yeah. Thank you for giving up some of your time. And much appreciated. Thank you, Peter. We're delighted to have your bee yard here. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. We'll go Thanks and see how the bees are doing now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, this yard, I came here to do some mite treatments, but I got the unexpected benefit of having a chat with Mark. 
that is really good because I saw he planted buckwheat here and uh, was having a look and didn't see as much activity as I'd hoped to. I thought I was here just, just before they would have stopped foraging. But it seems they start foraging way earlier than I ever anticipated. Even before dawn, they're on the buckwheat. The first thing he said to me when uh, I pulled in is that they have been so busy. So I'm looking forward to having a quick look. Now, these hives were only small. Uh, like several of my other yards, they were only nukes at the end of June. And so they've only had this month of July to build up. And uh, up till now, I've been just thinking, well, I'll just, just get them up to winter size uh, by the end of the year. But there's a few things going on that maybe it'll go faster than that. So we'll have a look and I'll uh, see how the bees are doing. Maybe they won't need any feeding with uh, all this buckwheat around. This patch here isn't that big, but he's got another patch coming in just beyond the fields over there as well. And that same point sounds very exciting. Let's have a look.